Hello, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Web Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen, Program Manager for the Recycling Center, and will as your moderator today. Today, we have Arb Brinkman from the National Technology Center to discuss end of life ops for wind turbines, and I will introduce her in a moment. We're going to have a QA session at the end of her presentation. So, if you have a question, comment, just the QA located on the channel on your screen. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for you via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. Also, please note that the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center, its affiliates and funders, and the National Recycling Coalition assume no liability resulting from the use of any information provided during the webinar. The webinar is only provided as an informational tool and no discrimination is intended and no endorsement by these organizations is implied. And now I'm gonna introduce Auburn. Uh, she's an engineering analyst at the National Wind Technology Center, which is part of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She specializes in techno, techno economic analysis of wind energy systems and offices of their life cycle from the installation decommissioning. She holds HD in mechanic aeronautical engineering from the UC of California days, where her research focused on the control of wind turbine blades. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Auburn. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. So um, as we just mentioned, I'll be talking about end of life options for wind turbine blades. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll give a little introduction and talk about what we're doing at NREL um, and then talk about uh, wind energy and how it's been growing and how that leads to some challenges for dealing with uh, blade materials. So um, I'll do a little review on, on some of those blade materials, uh, and how much we're expecting to see in the next few decades and what some of the opportunities might be for recycling or um, other end of life opportunities for those materials. Um, and finally wrap up with some time for Q&A. So the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL, um, as it says in the name, we focus on renewable energy. Um, we've got nearly 3000 employees uh, and we're always interested in partnering with other groups, industry, academic, government partners uh, to really promote the use of renewable energy. Um, in our electricity supply. And uh, like any good organization, we have a vision and a strategy for the next uh, several years to guide our, our work. Um, the first element, integrated energy pathways, is really our, our core uh, capabilities in terms of looking at the various renewable energy technologies like solar, wind, hydro, uh, biomass, you name it. And how these can be integrated into our electricity system, uh, including thinking about challenges like distributed generation sources and the electricity grid um, and transportation systems, which brings us to our next uh, pillar, which is uh, electrons to molecules. Um, and then finally, the third is what I'm going to be talking about today is a circular economy for energy materials. Um, so circular economy is probably a concept you're familiar with instead of the sort of traditional concept of producing an item, using it, and then throwing it away, we wanna to move to more recovery of materials, recycling of materials, and really thinking about that from a holistic perspective, starting from the design and manufacturing processes um, all the way through uh, the lifetime of a product, or um, in this case, an energy system. Um, and just to highlight a few of the the aspects that NREL is focusing on in terms of circular, circular economy uh, for energy materials. We're looking at circularity for polymers and composites, and that's particularly relevant to wind energy systems, um, as well as advanced energy materials and technologies and future materials for energy systems. And we're trying to really think about the entire life cycle from uh, the analysis and modeling, uh, processing the raw materials, manufacturing the energy systems, uh, designing those new systems and how they perform over their lifetime. So just to focus a little bit on wind energy and what NREL does in, in this space, um, we're really looking at enabling a low cost 
wind energy uh, supply, uh, supporting the grid, um, looking at multiple scales of technology, uh, and working to reduce the, the cost of energy. And I really want to highlight this last bullet point here, um, interested in enabling sustainable manufacturing, uh, both through new materials, new manufacturing processes, and um, just generally considering the design of wind turbines and how that interacts with their sustainability. So moving on to wind energy and how it's growing and how that produces some opportunities and some challenges for dealing with the materials that are required to produce energy from the wind. Um, as you're probably aware, have been hearing, the US energy supply is shifting. Uh, there's certainly been a reduction in the use of some fossil fuels and increase in generation from renewable sources. Um, if we just think about renewable sources, uh, except for hydropower, 10 years ago, they were producing less than 5% of our electricity supply, but today it's closer to 12% and that percentage is expected to continue growing. We focus on wind energy specifically. Uh, this top chart is showing the annual US electricity generating capacity from wind um, and how much is being added each year. So you can see we're adding several gigawatts a year, um, that's a couple thousand turbines a year um, over the past nearly 20 years. Um, and what that means for our energy supply in general, you can see on the, the bottom map um, that in certain regions of the country, the share of electricity that's generated from the wind um, is close to half of the in-state generation in some states. Um, and in several other states, it's a significant percentage as well. For the country as a whole, uh, wind is generating about 8% of total electricity. And then uh, take a look at this map. Uh, we're going to come back to talk about uh, the materials used for wind energy. And you'll see that some of these states will be uh, reappearing in, in our later discussion. And then. I think the next point to make about these wind turbines is not only are there more being installed uh, every year, but also that they're getting bigger. And um, so they're more powerful. Each, each turbine can generate more electricity, but also the diameter of the rotor is growing larger. And uh, if you are paying close attention to the numbers here, you'll see that the rotors are getting larger at a slightly faster rate than the uh, rated capacity is growing. And that enables these wind turbines to generate electricity for more hours of the year um, and in a variety of different sites. Um, but that can also contribute to this uh, question of the amount of material that's used. And really, that, that's increasing the amount of material that's, that's needed to produce a wind turbine. OK, so to break it down, what materials are used in a wind turbine? and what are our real concerns when it comes to end of life. So if you look at the, this material breakdown on the left, uh, this is just one example of a, a typical uh, modern turbine. Um, the main materials in the turbine are steel and iron, which uh, make up the, the tower um, is sort of the main component. Uh, parts of the generator and cell are these metals that we understand pretty well how to recycle. And there's already a good system in place for, for recycling these metals. You can see on the right that over 90% of, of all these metal components are typically recycled. Um, and there are some other you know, aluminum and copper used as well. But the next largest category uh, of a, the material breakdown are glass and carbon composites. And these are primarily what's used in the blades. And uh, as is highlighted here, they are really the material that make up the largest fraction of turbine materials that are not recycled. Um, they're challenging to recycle. And today, the most common destination for these materials is the landfill. Um, so if we look at the blades in a little more detail, as I mentioned, they're predominantly composite material. So for blades, that's 
most often fiberglass, um, but in some cases carbon fiber. Um, if you look on this diagram, you can see the spar cap that runs down the length of the blade. I think it's shown in this uh, black or dark gray color. Um, that element is really the, the strongest member of the blade, and that is where you see carbon fiber composites in some models. Um, but the, uh, the exterior portion of the blade is typically fiberglass. Um, fiberglass or carbon fiber is a great choice for these blades because they're very strong, they're lightweight, they're durable, they can stand up to decades out in all sorts of weather. Um, the, the trouble with these materials is that um, because of all these characteristics that are desirable while they're operating, they are very difficult to um, break down at the end of their service life. Um, so they're made up of glass or carbon fibers, and these are bonded to a, a resin that's uh, typically a thermoset, like epoxy. They can also be uh, some other polymers used in these resins. Um, the other materials in the blade, there's a core that's typically made of either balsa wood or polymer foam. There are coatings, uh, paints, uh, waterproofing and corrosion coating. Um, there are other components like uh, adhesives and um, bolts used to fasten onto the hub, um, lightning protection as well. So all of these components and materials are um, mixed together in the blade when it comes off the turbine. And so they need to be separated and then um, hopefully recycled or, or otherwise uh, dealt with at the end of life. So I think the first question that uh, comes up is, well, how much material are we talking about when we say that there's going to be uh, wind turbine blades that, that need to be dealt with? Um, and so this is something that we looked at in a study that was recently published. You can see the citation at the bottom if you'd like to, to dig into this some more. Um, and so the way we carried out this study was to look at uh, a great resource, the US Wind Turbine Database, which gives us the number and size of all turbines that are currently operating in the US. Um, and then to look at the future, we uh, used a projection of future wind energy capacity that uh, comes from NRL. We each year publish a standard scenarios. Um, and so we were looking at the, the mid case, which you can see at the bottom left, um, there's this uh, gray dotted line in the center of several uh, sort of yellow orange uh, alternate scenarios. Uh, so the, the mid case uh, projects out to 2050, uh, how much wind energy, energy generation uh, will we could be using in the United States. Um, so I'll point out here the third bullet, uh, we're assuming a constant 20 year lifetime for all wind turbines that were installed um, after the year 2000. Uh, so there are still some wind turbines operating from more than 20 years ago. Um, and as wind turbines are a newer technology, uh, there's certainly uh, still, manufacturers are still determining how long their products are going to last in the field. Um, they're starting to increase their estimates to 30 and even 40 years as a possible lifetime for these products. But to keep the analysis simple, we're looking at 20 years. And then finally, um, attaching sort of a mass of, of material to each blade. Uh, we used a paper published out of Cambridge University. Uh, there's a chart shown on the lower right. And that links the amount of blade material uh, to the rated capacity of the turbine, which is what we uh, have from this projection on the left. Okay, so when we take all these pieces and put them together, uh, what we end up with is uh, a projection of the amount of end of life blade mass that will need to be disposed of or retired um, in each year from 2020 out to 2050. Um, as you can see, we have a relatively small amount in the first several, several years. Um, that's on the order of 10,000 tons per year. Um, and then that goes up 
uh, following the trend as more turbines that were installed um, come out of service uh, through 2050. Um, and then just to put these numbers in context, I uh, added a bit of information in the top right about uh, waste disposal in general in the United States uh, in 2018. So uh, combining both municipal solid waste and construction and demolition waste, uh, both those categories see several millions, million tons per year um, going to landfill. So some context there. Um, okay, so returning to wind turbine blades and what massive material is going to be coming from them in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, if we look out to 2050, that total amount is a little over 2 million tons. Um, that's also in pretty good agreement with an earlier estimate from the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, but that's not the only source of waste, the end of life. Um, it's also important to think about uh, other points in the wind turbine life cycle when composite waste can be generated. Um, so the, the green bars are what I showed on the previous slide, the uh, cumulative end of life blade material. There's also in yellow um, material from replacement of blades, which can happen um, if there's a defect or damage, for example, to a, due to a lightning strike and they need to be replaced earlier than that assumed 20 year lifetime. And then finally uh, in blue at the bottom, we have uh, the material that comes out of the manufacturing process. And I wanted to highlight here that this is sort of the one wedge of material that um, we have the opportunity to really change in the near term. So um, blades that are already out there, already operating um, that material will need to be dealt with, but um, manufacturing waste can certainly be reduced with innovative processes or the use of new materials. Um, so this total cumulative amount is uh, close, a little over 3 million tons by 2050. But the cumulative numbers that I've been discussing are strongly affected by our assumption on wind turbine lifetime. So if we assume that turbines are actually being removed earlier than 20 years of service, then we see that increases the cumulative amount of waste. Um, just looking 10 years in the future, that increases the amount of waste by 96%. Um, conversely, if wind turbines operate for longer than 20 years, if they go up to 30 years of life, then that could reduce the expected waste in 2030 by 98%. So this is a particularly sensitive input to our analysis. And um, I would say the, the likely uh, total in the future is probably going to be somewhere between these points um, that some turbines are going to be removed sooner, some will be operating for much longer. Um, and so we, we hope that 20 year estimate is a, a reasonable point to start. Okay, finally, I wanted to address the point of landfill capacity. So right now, the, the most common option for wind turbine blades is to go to landfill. And um, they're large objects. Uh, they take up a lot of space in whatever landfill they go to. How does the volume of retired blades compare to the amount of landfill capacity in the United States? So we used an EPA estimate of landfill capacity, um, current capacity and annual waste intake. It's projected that forward to 2050 to get a volume of, of landfill capacity in 2050. And then the uh, blade material that's expected to be retired by 2050 is about 1% of that landfill capacity. Um, or if you take uh, the blades, which are sort of large hollow objects essentially, and, and you can crush or grind that material down to smaller shreds, then that gets you to about 0.02% of landfill capacity by mass. But an important point to note here, I'm gonna see if you remember the map we showed earlier. Um, there are some regions, particularly in, uh, the Northern Great Plains, where 
uh, landfill capacities are relatively smaller, the amount of blades is relatively larger, and there could be um, some concerns on la landfill capacity reaching with blades reaching about 30% of the remaining capacity, uh, assuming no additions to landfill capacity in that time. Okay, so now to move on to some methods for handling these blades once they've reached the end of life. Um, I'll just kind of quickly show this waste management hierarchy. This may be a familiar concept where the most preferred methods are on top, prevention of waste. Uh, going down to the bottom, the least preferred method is disposal in landfill or incineration without recovering any energy from the, the waste. So I'm gonna go through this pyramid from the bottom, starting with disposal. Um, so as I've mentioned, landfill is the most common destination for wind turbine blades at, at this point. Um, it is an inert material, uh, but can release methane during breakdown. And as I've mentioned, in some places there are constraints on the amount of landfill space uh, where these large objects would be a concern. Um, and there are some locations that prohibit landfill of wind turbine blades. Uh, in particular, that's a policy nationwide in Germany, but there are individual landfills that have prohibited uh, disposal of wind turbine blades in the US. Um, another option is incineration. This is something that's done on, in Europe um, in some places. It does reduce the waste volume. So um, if you're concerned about the space they're taking up, uh, this is a possible solution, but there's also concern about the possibility for hazardous emissions um, during incineration. Um, okay, there are several different recycling methods um, and I'll go through them fairly quickly. Um, so just to, at the top to mention, because landfills are, are much more common and more widely distributed than recycling facilities for these blades, um, any of these recycling methods could increase the transportation distance um, compared to landfill. Um, and then I guess the other thing I want to highlight about each of these methods is on the right hand side of each box I'm listing the TRL, which is the technology readiness level. A uh, high TRL of nine is uh, essentially a product or service that's ready for commercial uh, operation, uh, whereas one is your lowest TRL and that's basically a, an idea or a concept. So uh, the first recycling method I'll describe here is mechanical recycling, and that's essentially shredding or grinding. You can see an example of some of that shredded blade material. These are larger pieces um, over here on the left. And that can be used for products like sound insulation or fiberboard panels. Um, and I would say a concern to highlight here is that just during handling, when these are being ground, um, there, you need to take precautions um, in terms of the dust that's emitted during the grinding process. Another mechanical recycling process uh, that's a little more on the lab scale at this point um, comes from mining industries for crushing rocks um, called high voltage pulse fragmentation. And that combines both uh, mechanical crushing with uh, electrical pulses to break down uh, and separate the fiber from resin. Um, and then another process that is beginning to be used in the US, uh, GE has recently announced a partnership with Veolia to uh, process its blades uh, when wind farms are repowering. So what they do in this process is you take the blade, shred it and incinerate it in a cement kiln in place of coal. That heat uh, is used in the cement process and then the um, residue from the glass fiber is used in the cement uh, in place of clinker, which is a, a component of cement. Um, so this is a process that's beginning to be adopted in the US. It's also been used in Europe as well. Uh, the next several processes are, um, again, being used more at a lab scale, especially for uh, glass. Um, and then carbon fiber as well. Carbon fiber is a higher value material. Um, so to some extent, it could be a higher value recycled product as well. Um, so the first three 
methods here are all forms of pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is basically low oxygen combustion that separates the fibers from the resins and the resins are turned into either liquid or gaseous hydrocarbons. Um, particularly for glass fibers, this can uh, weaken the fibers. Um, carbon fiber, that reduction is less pronounced. So there's interest in other pyrolysis uh, variations such as microwave assisted pyrolysis or fluidized bed gasification. Um, and these have some promise for um, producing higher value fibers. Finally, I'll mention chemical recycling processes such as solvolysis or hydrolysis. And these are processes that use either water or other chemicals to separate the fibers without reducing their length and maintaining more of their uh, strength and physical properties than some other processes for recycling. So since that was a lot of recycling methods, I just wanted to provide a, a quick comparison. Um, on this slide, looking at energy balance. Uh, so in the chart on the left, uh, you can see the energy demand for, for several different processes. So a low energy demand um, is, is generally going to help your, your net energy input um, for these blades over their life cycle. On the right, um, we're looking at that net impact. Um, and so here, a, a lower number is better because we're seeing a, a lower net impact compared to landfill. Um, and in fact, you can see that for a couple of these processes, um, for fiberglass, GF, um, the net impact is actually greater. So there's a higher energy input for these processes um, compared with landfill. Okay, and then one more set of comparisons between all these different recycling methods. Um, as I had mentioned on the right, we have the technology readiness level. Um, so you can see that some of the most commercially ready processes are pyrolysis, uh, mechanical grinding or shredding, and energy recovery, um, whereas some of the other processes mentioned were uh, still in development. Um, and then finally at the bottom left, uh, comparison of prices um, and costs. Um, so we have the process costs in orange. Um, in blue is the anticipated value of uh, carbon fire, fiber recycling. Um, and then in yellow, you can see fiberglass. Uh, you can see that generally fiberglass uh, is going to be a, a lower value product. Um, but for some of the lower cost processes, such as mechanical grinding and cement co-processing, um, there is in fact value in uh, the recycled material. Okay, so continuing through the pyramid of the waste management hierarchy. Um, so above recycling, we get to repurpose and reuse. Um, there are markets for secondhand blades um, or in fact, complete turbines uh, that can, can be reused. Uh, I think the, the challenge here is really these are very big machines um, or very big blades if, if you're focusing on secondhand blades and uh, transporting them um, is both costly and, and has energy impacts as well. Um, but certainly reuse can be a good option, especially when it can be done in a, a relatively local fashion. Um, and then repurposing as well. So there's uh, a whole range of suggestions for things that can be done with uh, old blades, um, such as a playground. Uh, that's an example of a real playground in the Netherlands that uses uh, recycled blades um, or repurposed blades. Uh, there are some concepts for bridges or uh, roofing materials. Um, I think the challenge here is really to match local needs to these concepts. And then finally, uh, talking about how we can prevent generating waste. So um, I had touched on earlier the impact that increasing lifetime has on reducing the amount of waste. Um, you can see on the bottom left, this is that same chart of, of net impacts for blades and that there's a significant decrease for all types of blades um, just by increasing their lifetime. Um, either five years uh, is second from the right or 10 years is all the way to the right on that chart. 
Um, and this can also be an economical decision to defer the costs of tearing down blades and uh, still are able to generate income from the power production. And finally, I wanna talk about uh, design for circularity as a way to prevent waste. So there's research going on now at NREL and, and other places looking at possible alternatives to the typical epoxy resins that could be uh, more easily recycled and more easily separated from the carbon or glass fibers. Another idea is to use a modular design where uh, if a blade has damage in one part, um, that portion of the blade could be removed and replaced uh, rather than having to replace the full blade. Um, and so I think design for circularity is something that could have a huge impact when new, new blades uh, go on the market and then reach the end of their life. But over the next 20 years or so, we'll predominantly be dealing with the blades that are already deployed today. Okay, so to go on to some of the work that we're continuing to do um, and hope to do in the future, um, one project that I'm involved with right now is creating an agent-based model for a wind circular economy. And what an agent-based model enables us to do is to consider um, all of the different types of people or entities like a company that is involved in the um, life cycle of a blade from manufacturing to use to recycling or landfilling. Um, and then each of the, the colored ovals on this diagram represents these different types of agents. And they're all uh, modeled um, as having their own uh, motivations and behaviors. Uh, they can be influenced by social networks um, between uh, different types of agents. Um, and this really gives us a more detailed look that not only at you know, how do costs of recycling influence decisions, but also how does the uptake of, of recycling by other uh, peers influence these agents. Um, and this is building on work that's mentioned at the bottom. This type of agent-based model has already been used for solar PV, and we are, are building on that to try to get some interesting insights into the future of recycling for wind blades as well. And finally, I wanted to mention the International Energy Agency Wind Task 45, which is something that's just getting started. Um, this is something that is looking to collaborate with other academic and industry partners. Um, and listed down at the bottom, Derek Berry at NREL is one of the uh, coordinators for this task. And so he is uh, someone to get in touch with if you think you can contribute to uh, establishing best practices for managing end-of-life blades, uh, establishing standards, uh, providing guidance on upscaling recycling processes, and just developing the value chains for recycling blades. Okay, and then finally to kind of summarize some of the points I've been talking about today, uh, wind energy is really supplying a growing share of US electricity generation. And while that has a lot of benefits, it also results in the use of a lot of composite material that could be difficult to recycle um, or dis dispose of in a sustainable way. Um, that amount could be over 2 million tons by 2050. Um, and there have been development of several alternatives for recovering material and energy, but so far uh, landfill has been sort of the default and most cost-effective option in many cases. Um, so there's a need for more work to develop these alternatives and really make recycling and repurposing into uh, the best options for wind turbine blades. And one way to do that is to incorporate new materials into future wind turbine blades that uh, consider recyclability from the start. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Auburn. That's a really interesting presentation. Uh, so uh, we're gonna now field some questions. Uh, again, if you have a question, please use the uh, Q and A feature on your computer. 
And we have a few questions already. Um, this question, uh, I think this goes back to somewhere in the middle of the presentation. Uh, one of your slides showed uh, some uh, values. Do you know what currency that was shown in? I'm not sure what slide it was, but I'm assuming it's US dollars. Um, yeah, let's see. Somewhere in the 20s, so I, I know there was this. OK, this one doesn't show any there actual is. values, but it it's in euros. Um, right there. But they're just indicative. So I, I believe that would be comparable um, in dollars. I don't okay. believe I had um, any other currency. OK, I think that was it. OK, uh, next question is, uh, how are the blades and turbines currently transported at the end of life? Do you know to what extent and the size they are broken down to? Uh, yeah, so I think that that depends to some extent on a, you know specific uh, decisions at the wind plant. But uh, yeah, it's typical to break them down into uh, several pieces. I think um, something that will fit on a standard truck of you know 45 to 50 feet um, is is going to enable that transportation to be cheaper. Um, you don't need to have an oversized load permit and all the the expense and logistics that goes into that. So um, that's going to vary a bit state by state um, as well. Uh, how complex or expensive that logistical piece is, um, but it's. As I mentioned, the uh, the blade material is quite durable, and it's difficult to break down um, much. Well, the smaller you want to break it down, the more effort you have to put in. So I think keeping as they're kept to those uh, sort of maximum size that you can fit on a truck and and achieve the logistics uh, without too much expenses is where you hit that sweet spot. Uh, we did get a request for a copy of the presentation. Uh, so should they contact you by email, Auburn? Yeah, that that would work fine. I don't, do you have I a share it that way? Do you have that on a slide or can you just um, email? I'm sorry, I don't think I included that. Um, okay. But yeah, I can put that in the chat. Okay, thanks. Um, are financial assurance instruments in place for recycling turbines? So the only... Uh, financial agreement that I'm aware of is, as I mentioned, uh, GE and Veolia have a partnership that involves uh, GE uh, paying for the transport and recycling of blades in projects that are repowering with GE turbines. Um, and that's the uh, cement co-processing. For the more readily recyclable portions of the blade slash turbine, uh, i.e. steel and concrete, do we know if these portions are regularly being recycled? Uh, yes, I believe they are. I had shown, um, here we go. So the, the chart on the right, this is from a life cycle analysis of um, this particular turbine. And so these percentage of um, sort of disposal end of life treatments uh, correspond. I think this was a, a European uh, case study because Vestas is in uh, Denmark, but these are fairly typical numbers there. And I think that carries over to the US as well in terms of, of metal recycling rates. Yeah, I would think if it's a standalone steel uh, piece of equipment, I think that would be readily recycled. You know, most demolition contractors would would count that as, as a, something that they could recycle and, and get some return on that. Yeah, and that's certainly a, a part of the decommissioning process is, right. is trying to recover some value from those components like the tower that are predominantly steel and, and you can get some income from that. Okay, uh, slide 24 states the blades are inert 
or non-hazardous. With the pain, epoxy, et cetera, has there been any T-clip testing or what are they using for their waste determination for landfilling? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can go into any detail on how they've been tested. Um, so if you'd like to follow up, uh, I can go. So this was from a this paper referenced here, Ramirez Tejeda. Um, and I do have the references listed here as well. Um, and feel free to email me for that, that reference on the uh, disposal of, of blades and characterization of that material. I, I would think that, uh, I know like in Pennsylvania, they, you know, if you want to landfill some type of residual material, uh, you know, you, before it goes to a municipal landfill, it has to be tested for, for the hazardous materials. So I'm not sure if that's a record requirement, which is a federal requirement for all landfills in, in the country. But I know, for example, Pennsylvania does require that, that kind of testing to make sure it's not a hazardous waste going into that landfill. Yeah, and I think to the extent we've uh, looked at practices across the US, they, uh, they appear to be generally classified as, as not hazardous, but yeah, I'm sure there's individual requirements that need to be met on a case-by-case -case basis. So. Do you have any thoughts on end of life option deserts, uh, quote unquote, around the US, i.e. some states have an interest in pursuing alternatives to landfilling, but there's nothing available within their region? Yeah, um, that's certainly a, a difficult situation. And I think this is really a good time to be thinking about this, maybe on a, a commercial level as a, an opportunity to, to begin some of this recycling, because as I've pointed out, you know, the amount of material is expected to grow. Uh, there are other contributors to composite waste as well. Um, such as aerospace. So I think if there's a concentration of the material that there can be a business case to begin uh, recycling in some of these deserts um, where there's a, a need for it. Okay. And, and just to comment on, uh, I know, you know, your, one of your slides shows uh, potential use of, of the, the fiberglass components in concrete, particularly in the, in the production of concrete. But I'm aware of, uh, I know there's one company in Pennsylvania that uses uh, fiberglass uh, as a substitute for metal rebar and, and mesh in, uh, in vaults and tanks that they produce. So I'm just thinking if there's a you know, possibility of, of looking at this material as potential for use in actual the concrete product itself uh, for, for a strength uh, you know, benefit. Uh, also, uh, there's also some transportation projects in Pennsylvania that they're they're looking at plastics and asphalt to make it more pliable and last longer. I'm just thinking there's another possible uh, research opportunity for for this material. Yeah, there's certainly a lot going on in the the concrete space in terms of uh, possible incorporation of new materials that can contribute to overall sustainability. So yeah, that's a really interesting area. Do, you, do any US states have requirements for wind farm operators who prepare decommissioning plans and pay for the end of life management? Yeah, that's a relatively common requirement, um, either on a state level or on a county level um, to prepare a decommissioning plan. And then that varies uh, you know, by locality uh, on the requirements for, for providing funds for that decommissioning. But yeah, that does occur around the United States. Okay. All right. I think that's it for the question. So we're going to wrap it up. Uh, great questions, everybody. I appreciate the, your input. And so this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be made uh, available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you'll join us for next month's webinar. And please visit the uh, NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates. And thank you, Auburn. I appreciate uh, you taking the time out to make this presentation. And, and thanks for joining us, everybody. And have a great day.